All right, so tonight we are going to be looking at chapters 10, 11, and 12. So this is a pretty aggressive uh, move I'm making to move us along in the study. And because there is so much imagery and so much symbolism in here, it might appear to be a little difficult to understand, but I'm, I'm going to try my very best to clarify some things. And if you need to stop me and ask a question, by all means, please do so. But this is a real interesting and exciting uh, part of the lesson. And I think you're going to um, hear and see a lot of things that you may have forgotten about or just didn't know existed in this word. So last week, just as a quick review, excuse me, just as a quick review for last week, we talked about um, the next set of judgments, and that's the seven trumpets. And we got through the first six. Just as a quick overview, I'm not going to go through each one of them, but we know that the earth is going to go through some real trauma during this particular time because there will be a lot of interesting natural events that are going to occur. A lot of uh, the vegetation and the trees and the forestry is going to be destroyed. There will be great losses of life that will occur. A lot of the water and the streams and the springs will be poisoned. Many people will die because they can't have access and won't have access to clean drinking water. And uh, even those who um, will have access to it, um, it's just, well, it just won't be drinkable. And uh, food will be scarce. There'll be a lot of poverty. There may be war going on. I mean, it's just going to be a very terrible time. So each of these trumpets is blown, and every time one is blown, something occurs. There's going to be great darkness upon the earth. And that should be expected when you think about the fact that the Bible tells us that Jesus is light. So if he is not upon the earth, if his people are no longer upon the earth, who can emanate that light? So it's going to be, even in the daytime, there'll be a third of the earth that will be uh, in darkness. And you know, terrible things happen in the dark, right? So it's just going to be awful, really, really horrible time. And we've already established that through so many ways of looking at this. So we looked at six of the trumpets. We found that the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh one are all going to have woes attached to those. So we saw the two woes and the, the, the woe that was in the fifth trumpet and we saw the one that was in the sixth trumpet. In the fifth trumpet, there was this celestial being that was allowed to come upon the earth and they were given the key to the underworld and was allowed to open it up. And when they did, there will be lots of evil and lots of evil spirits that will be allowed to roam the earth and to do damage to people. Uh, they were described in some ways as locusts. We see two different things going here. These could be actual locusts that will be upon the earth that will have uh, the ability to torture mankind, sting them like scorpions, and harm them, but they won't be able to, the men will not be able to die. Mankind won't be able to die, even though they will wish for death. And then there's another one in the trumpet, um, in the sixth, uh, the sixth trumpet sounding, where these four angels that God has kept locked away just for a time like this, and they will be unleashed upon the earth to do all the damage that they're going to do. And so it just sounds like God's got some things saved up for some evil people. And by this time, you know, we might, we have not been exposed to the kind of evil that the Jews will have experienced. There will be another Holocaust of sorts where a lot of anti-Semitism will occur and Satan is trying to wipe out the Jews. Keep that in mind because as long as they are there and, and they are the chosen people of the Lord Jesus and he's coming back for his people, then Satan feels like if he can stop them, if he can wipe them out, then Jesus won't return and he won't suffer defeat. But we know that God is in control of all things and that Satan will uh, certainly indeed uh, suffer defeat. Uh, nonetheless, even through all of this devastation and destruction that is being predicted and prophesied by John, we also know that there are people who will not repent. There will still be people who are unrepentant. And so they are going to have to suffer farther uh, in these times, and they will be there wreaking havoc as well. The devil's going to have his way. The 144,000 who are left as this remnant to go out and to preach the gospel to the people, they are sealed by God. So they're going to go out and they're going to try to, you know, save as many people as possible. So to, right up until the end, God is going to be extending his mercies to people and allowing them another opportunity to yield and to repent and to find a place in, a heaven, in their heavenly home. 
Keep in mind, those of us who already know Christ will be up in heaven while all of this is occurring. This is the time of the tribulation. And tonight we'll find that it's not just the tribulation that's going to occur in those first three and a half years, but the great tribulation will occur when those three and a half years have passed and the Antichrist comes on board and uh, tricks everybody. And then um, he's going to do this abomination that causes desolation that we've heard about. And that's when things are really going to get bad. As if to say the things that have occurred this far was not bad, were not bad enough. Okay. So with that in mind, that is a quick review of what we talked about last week. And so now we'll move forward. We're in chapter 10. And I'm not going to read everything from chapter 10, but I will give you something of a heads up um, around specific areas of it. So there's a short period of time that will occur between the blowing of the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. So um, as we look at uh, chapter 10, we are going to see what is going to occur between an angel and this little scroll that he's going to hold in his hand. So I'll give you this description. Now this sounds really strange, but just remember this is all symbolism. So John is seeing this. He says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a, a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. Uh, when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. It's interesting that there are still things that God is going to be withholding from his people. There are things we're not going to know. And uh, Paul even described this in 2 Corinthians uh, 12 and 4, where he said he was caught up in the third heaven. So somewhere even above that uh, I don't even know there were layers of heaven, but way up high in heaven. And he said, uh, quote, I heard, an inex I heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. So there are still mysteries surrounding um, what God has uh, in store. And we won't know the fullness of any of that until we come into the kingdom fully and we are able to reign and, and, and cast judgment even ourselves. We will be almost equal in line with Jesus, right? So we'll be able to judge people. The word tells us we'll even be able to judge angels. So, but at this particular time, he's saying, no, withhold this information. Don't tell them what's going on. So uh, John doesn't write it down. We have no clues as to what's in there. It's just another mystery and a secret. So, and we don't need to know everything. All we need to do is learn to trust God in all things. And uh, that's a great exercise. And in that particular time, oh my goodness, um, when you see how much stuff went the wrong way, I don't know if they really want to know everything that was going to happen. So at this particular time, this huge, this mighty, mighty angel is standing and, and before John. And to me, when I look at how he's described. He is so big. And a lot of people think that it's Jesus, but there are other people who dispute it because it's described, first of all, as just a mighty angel, not really a reference to Christ. And even as it's written in the word, you know, when uh, a lot of biblical scripture is written, uh, anything related to Jesus is in capital letters, but not here. And so um, he's describing, he, he raises his hand and he declares that there will be no more delay. All right, so he's about to say, and let's just go, that's in verse seven. I'm gonna take you over there real quick. So after he tells John, don't write anything, keep everything sealed up. He says um, in verse, let's see, in verse six, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all this, uh, and all that is in them, the earth and all that's in it, and the sea and all that's in it, and said, there will be no more delay. So you remember when he had to say to the martyrs, when they were saying, oh, Lord, how long, how long before you avenge us? And he said, just a little while longer, just wait, right? Well, after we get to the point where the seventh trumpet is about to be sounded, there will be no more delay. This, this angel is declaring, okay, the time of waiting is over. The big showdown is about to happen between God and his arch enemy, which is the devil. And in verse seven, it says, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, okay, we're about to get into that seventh uh, trumpet. 
the mystery of God will be accomplished. So all those things we didn't know, all those things our parents told us we'll find out in a sweet by and by, that stuff is about to take place and we're, it's going to be made clearer. Just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So, uh oh, okay, things are about to start clicking right now. And so um, this is a warning to us that the Antichrist that is in existence at this particular point is about to burst upon the scene and that the final showdown between him and God is about to take place. So he describes in the final parts of chapter 10, let me go forward with some of this, um, this um, scroll that he's holding in his hand and the word is describing that, not him, but there's a, an angel, this angel uh, gives this scroll and it's called a little scroll or a tiny scroll to John. And he tells him to eat it. And so it didn't make a whole lot of sense at first where you say, well, why, why are they making a big deal over the fact that this is a small scroll? But it's because it needs to be small enough. Remember this angel, this vision that John sees of this angel, he's huge, he's massive. He's got one foot in the ocean, he's got one foot on, on land. And it just shows that's symbolic of the strength and the might of the Lord God. And that um, everything is under his control things upon the earth, things on the sea, everything. Um, and so John, still being human, is offered this scroll and he's told to eat it. So the scroll has to be made small so that John can eat it. But he is warned that as he eats this, it's going to taste sweet like honey in his mouth, but it's gonna sour on his stomach. It's gonna become bitter in his stomach. And what that symbolizes for John is this, that, you know, as much as he has been called to be a messenger of God and as rewarding as it is to share the word of God and to declare the Lord as king and to declare him as one who is sovereign and is over all things and in charge of all things, the one who loves us and the one who has given his son to be um, our, our savior and our Messiah, as big as all of that is, as big and as mighty as he is, that uh, that's a wonderful position to be in as a messenger, but going forward, as sweet as that word is in his mouth, he is now going to have to share this prophecy that's going to be awful, just destructive. It is going to be a judgment coming toward the people or coming upon the people. And that's why it's gonna be putting knots in his stomach. He's gonna be literally sick from having to share um, what the people will have to endure, all right? So that's uh, the, what it means for him to have this little scroll. And the final uh, verse 11 says, then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, by this time, I'm sure John is just worn out because we have been going through, you know, several chapters of this vision of what he's described. And it's, there's no, there's hardly any good news in it. Well, if we want to hearken back to where the believers are, there is. If you want to think about those who can still have an opportunity to be saved, then there is. But of course, we know those who will have that opportunity through the great tribulation will also have to face uh, great uh, stress uh, upon their lives as well. All right, so here comes the Antichrist, okay? And this is, this is the Antichrist. As I mentioned to you all before, um, we have known Antichrist to come throughout history. And so those like little letter Antichrist, you know, small demons and devils that were coming through, but this is the one, this is a big one that is coming through to really wreak havoc upon mankind. And he is going to be slick. He will be a man, but he is a man who is driven by the wiles of Satan. And he is very much um, like the total opposite picture of what Christ is. So he, of course, will not be born of a virgin. Uh, to put it bluntly, as I'm reading and studying about who he is, they say his, um, let me see the way it's written here. Um, he's, uh, all right, so thus as Christ was born of a virgin by means of conception by the Holy Spirit, the Antichrist will be born of a whore by means of conception by a diabolical spirit. And although opinions differ as to whether Antichrist's father will be a man or a demon, in either case, he will be, as commonly noted in the Middle Ages, full of the devil from the time of his conception. So this is a, a person born into evil, all right? Both Christ and the Antichrist are born of the Jews, but the Antichrist will be born of the tribe of Dan. We talked about that in a previous class, which is quote, called the viper in the road. And that's why Dan, um, his, his, um, his particular tribe, will not be one of those that are sealed uh, as part of the 144,000. 
And rather, um, he will come from the tribe, like Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. He will come from the tribe of, of Dan. And then like Christ, Antichrist will grow up in obscurity and begin his open ministry at around the age of 30, gaining followers by giving signs and performing miracles. But his are going to be tricks and people are going to fall for it. His triumphant reign will last for three and a half years. And like Christ, Antichrist will come to Jerusalem. So all of this, which I'm going to describe to you today, is going to happen in Jerusalem, but it's going to be the opposite of Christ. He's going to fool, fool people. You know where Christ was kind of received at first in Jerusalem. They were throwing palm leaves in front of him when he rode in on the donkey uh, the week before his uh, crucifixion. Uh, oh, what a difference a week makes. Those same people who were declaring him as the king and worshiping him then turned on him and they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. Well, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to fool these people so much that they are going to be willing to fall at his feet and to see him and declare him as one who is their savior. And it's going to happen because there's going to be something going on at this particular time on the earth where I've told you there's going to be much calamity. So we don't know exactly what that is. And we believe that the Antichrist is going to be somebody who will make his way up the ranks. He's going to come in at a time when there's so much distress among the people that they're looking for a savior. And this person is gonna come in and set himself up to be the one to take care of everything. Now there's some, um, there's some speculation that it might be something around um, making peace between Israel you know how they've been fighting there for what hundreds of years in Israel, right? Between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians, and so I would highly encourage you. I've always said, y'all keep looking at current events. So the Jewish Times, I think, is one of the local papers. I'm going to start reading that. But you know, nobody's been able to uh, broker a peace deal. Every president we've had has tried to broker a peace deal between Israel and the Palestinians. And so uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians, but have not been able to do it. They all offered this two state solution, but nobody really wants to budge. Well, this man will do the impossible. So he, it's a speculation or a belief that he's going to be the one that's going to set this up. And oh my goodness, where nobody else was able to make this happen, he's going to do it. And he's going to bring about peace and there's going to be joy and excitement and celebration. And he's going to look real good on the surface. And once he's got them in his grips, once he's got them praising him for the work that he's done, he's going to take it a step further. And he's going to get to a point where he's going to be expecting people to worship him. He's going to make himself equal with God and he's going to start putting down religion. And, you know, the church is basically gone anyway, anyway, but that 144,000 is still going to be around trying to preach the gospel. I also um, heard uh, in a sermon that I was listening to that there are some um, scholars and some evangelicals from, I think, about a century ago that are anticipating this time. They don't know, of course, when it comes. And they may be, I think they're gone now for sure. They're not still alive. However, they are preparing for this time because we're going to learn before we leave today that um, the Lord is going to make a place of a safe haven for the Jews during the time when the Great Tribulation is occurring. And so when he makes the safe haven, the people who anticipate that that's coming, they have already hidden New Testament Bibles um, that are written in Hebrew for those who will be left behind. All right. They're hidden somewhere in Israel in a place called, I think, Pella or Petra or somewhere uh, that's supposed to be, that's believed to be the place where the Lord will hide his people. And so they will still have access to scripture, but they won't be able to do that out in the open because they will be persecuted and there will also be, uh, you know, loss of life. So this is a time when there will be. Uh, apostasy, not a lot of religion going on, not a lot of people will renounce it, will not um, embrace uh, the scriptures in the ways that we're doing it right now. People will be deceived. They're going to see signs and wonders. Um, they're going to, and, and what this person is going to do, this antichrist is going to set himself up. So this abomination that causes desolation, this man is going to set himself up in the temple of God. All right. He's going to place himself as one on the throne and he's going to demand that the people worship him. So this is why we have to look at how people who are in leadership uh, in our countries and in these various nations, we got to look at the rise of some of these people. This person is supposed to have a meteoric rise. Uh, when he starts his ministry or his work, he's going to go fast track right up to the top. Because remember, the tribulation is only going to last seven years. 
and he's going to do his due for the first three and a half years and fool the people. And by the middle part of that, uh, in those three and a half years, that's when he's going to be so full of arrogance and haughtiness that he's going to come in and say, now y'all have to worship me. And Hitler was just a, a kind of a harbinger to that. He was one that started that. And we just saw it on a small scale, but this one's going to be just um, an atrocity. All right, so he's going to turn on the people. All right, let's keep it moving. Now we're moving into... Um, the into chapter um oh let me finish this right quick too chapter 10 still so there's um there's this scripture a description i should say of the temple he's giving him instruction about measuring the temple and so this says i know it says chapter 10 on my slide i mean chapter 11 there so let's look at this real quick um starting with verse one i was given a read like a, a measuring rod uh john says and was told go and measure the temple of god and the altar and count the worshipers there but exclude the outer court do not measure it because it has been given to the gentiles they will trample on the holy city for 42 months and i will give power to the, my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So what's going on here? What is this temple? Because remember, John is writing this in AD 90. The temple was destroyed in AD 70. So what is he talking about? And uh, so when we look at this, uh, the belief is that just as we say today that the church is not the physical uh, building, the church is the people. Well, this they believe is the reference that he makes there. He says, measure the temple, but exclude the outer court. So this temple is his people, those he is, who he has set aside for himself, that he's bringing together and that he's going to uh, uh, rescue, in a sense. Um, the rest of it are the people who are not the chosen people of God and will reject him. He says, they're going to trample all over the city anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold these, these people close to me. And so while the temple has been destroyed, this is the church. And so he's talking, when he talks about measuring, he's talking about sealing them, just like with the 144,000 were sealed. Others will be sealed as well so that God will note his people from those who are rejecting uh, his people. All right. And so uh, I got something in chat. Oh, y'all only see in the first slide of the presentation. My apologies. Let me um, try to get this moving for y'all then. Didn't realize that was the case. Thank you for letting me know. And I'm going to stop the share and then I'm going to put it back up again because sometimes um, that works a little bit better. And then let me know um, if you see, do y'all see measure the temple but exclude the outer court right now? All right, very good. Thank you for letting me know that. All right. All right, let's keep it moving. Thank y'all. All right. And so now we have these two witnesses that he described. And there's a lot of speculation about who these two witnesses are. But we know that they are coming to assist the 144,000 that are going to be sharing the word of God. But these are going to be some powerful preachers that are coming. And so some people say it's Enoch because we know he never died. He was just caught up in heaven. Some say it's Elijah because Elijah never died either. All right. And then some say it's Moses. And But what most people believe, um, and of these two, so the most common thought and belief, it is Elijah and Moses. Now, remember that they met with Jesus um, on the Mount of Transfiguration, had something of a little staff meeting up there with him. And so um, just the way they describe the powers that these two men had when they come, it's very reminiscent of the powers that Moses and Elijah had when they were upon earth too. They caused drought. They dealt, um, were able to um, cause these plagues and fire and all those things that we see as a description of them. So they're going to be in Jerusalem. All of this is going to be taking place in, a, in Jerusalem. They're going to be sent there and they're going to um, uh, um, prophesy and preach to the people and try to get as many people as they can um, closer to the, to the Lord and to, to save them. They're going to prophesy for 1260 days. That's the equivalent of that three and a half years that I was telling you about. Okay. And so they'll get the opportunity to do that. People will get a chance to hear this word, but you know, the Antichrist is not going to allow that to happen on, um, on challenged, I guess. So he's going to come at them and they're going to get a chance to prophesy for 1260 days. However, they won't be able to complete that prophecy or that preaching. 
So let's look at, we're still in chapter 11. And so here's what it reads around um, chapter, I mean, verse seven. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. You remember Sodom and Egypt, I mean, these were horrible places. Sodom was burned up. We know the Egyptians they had to flee from. And so this is how Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was also crucified, this is going, Jerusalem is not going to be the kind of place you want to be in at that time. So um, for three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze upon their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. So they're going to be killed by Satan and their bodies are going to lay in the street for three and a half days. And, uh, you know, back when this was written uh, and, you know, before the Internet and cable TV and all this stuff, the old preachers always wondered how in the world will people be able to know that this is happening? Because everybody's going, going to know about it. And we look at it, we see it here written in the word where it says every people, tribe, language and nation will gaze on their bodies. How is that possible? Well, now we know in this day and age of cable TV, social media, where everything goes viral, uh, these people will lay in the streets and everybody will have access to knowing what's going on all over the globe. Anybody who has access to these me uh, methods and modes of communication will be able to see these people lying in the street. And that was something uh, to leave two people in Jerusalem, to leave two Jews in the street for three and a half days is an atrocity in their minds, too, because the Jews tend to bury their dead within 24 hours. They will be prevented from uh, being able to bury them. And so, you know, those who know and will keep with custom will be appalled by this, where others will be celebrating the death of them, glad that they're dead, glad that their message is gone, right? But oh, oh, oh. That is not how the story ends. So if we go, uh, keep looking in chapter 11 at verse 11, it says, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. So that's going to be an absolutely frightening experience for the people who watched them. Their bodies were lying in the street. And then all of a sudden, they're going to stand up. They're going to get up. And then they're going to be caught up again to heaven. Now, how are they going to explain that? These people are going to see great wonders at this time, things that are going to make them marvel, things that are going to have them uh, scratching their heads. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to be going on. And even though they can't explain them, remember, the Antichrist will have done all kinds of miracles and tricky stuff and interesting things as well. So people won't know what to believe. It's going to be a really confusing time. And if they're not in the scriptures, if they don't know the scriptures that we're learning right now, they don't know to expect this. So it's going to be really uh, bizarre to them. And so um, they'll be easily confused and also easily manipulated. And that's why you have to educate yourself. All right. All right. Let's see. So every nation's going to see them. They're going to be caught up in heaven. And the death and the resurrection of these two will cause many people to believe in God. Let's look at... Um, we looked at verses uh, 11 through 14. And so what's interesting about, well, we stopped at, we stopped at uh, 12, but I want to read 14 because 14 has a dire warning. And it says, the second woe has passed and the third woe is coming soon. So remember, the, the trumpet hasn't even been blasted yet. And all of this stuff has been going on. All right. Thank you all so much for all of the comments on Facebook. I appreciate you. All right. So. Let's keep it moving. They're caught up in heaven. People are going to see this. Some will believe and they will believe in God and God is going to still be drawing some of his people to him. So glory, hallelujah. And here is the victory. Uh, when the seventh trumpet blasts, bottom line, here's what's going to happen. God wins. That's it. Here is the victory. Here's the declaration of the victory. This is the time to sing and shout and say glory, hallelujah, because now the big showdown that's about to happen between God and Satan is about to take place. And oh my, 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 it's going to be a horrible time for Satan. 
All right, let's look at this. Um, if you look at verse 15, I'm not gonna read all of this stuff, but just verse 15 says, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven, which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. So that's the victory y'all, that's the victory song. This is a picture of the coming full glory of God. It's a terrifying threat to his enemies. And uh, this is where the Ark of the Covenant, we will be able to see it, it will be on full display. All those things we heard about will be there and visible for all of those who believe. And so what's also interesting is this is also going to be a time for judgment as well as reward. So in verse 17, uh, it says, um, let's see, verse 17 says, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. So this is the reigning of the Lord Jesus. He will take his seat upon the throne. And so uh, for those of you who can see it on Facebook, I, I really like this uh, picture of these two mighty and very strong angels who have this evil angel on his knees and chained up before the throne because you know, even the angels would be judged. And we know that not all of them supported the Lord. Many of them left uh, heaven with Satan and chose to be in his army and they will suffer the, um, the, all of the penalties that will come from uh, not following him. And so let's look at that. Let's go here uh, into chapter 12 now and look at the description of the woman and the dragon. Okay, so what is this all about? My goodness. So there's a lot of symbolism here too. And so as we look at this, I want you to consider um, what some of this, how this could be in play in the real world. So in verse 12, uh, in chapter 12, it describes it like this, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. All right, what does all of that mean? What does some of that sound like to you? Well, this woman, a lot of people think, is that the Virgin Mary? Because of course she's pregnant and we're finding out that she's going to have this male child, all right? She does represent God's faithful people. She is the one who is carrying the Messiah. It's not necessarily Mary. Remember, this is just a symbol of the birth of Christ. Because of course, Christ is already born and he's died in, in all of you know, the whole uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. But what John is looking at is, uh, it's almost like going back in time and looking at the beginnings of this whole story of the life of Jesus Christ. And so she is indicative. The woman represents the church and us waiting for the Messiah. And while we are trying to wait for the Messiah, there is everything that's trying to go against Jesus Christ. So this crown of 12 stars that we see upon her head, they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And Satan, of course, is the red dragon. Just like when we saw that the four horses of the apocalypse, the red one was all about uh, death and war. Same thing, this red dragon represents that too, the fire and the, and the hate and all of the, um, everything that's inflamed against Christ, all right? And so he, of course, is um, looking at the birth of Jesus Christ. It's interesting to think that from the time Jesus came upon the earth, his life was under threat. Imagine that. Your entire life, somebody's gunning from you. You didn't even get present hardly. You know, you, you, you didn't even learn to talk yet or walk yet. And remember King Herod, he was trying to kill him from the very beginning, Right when he ordered the, uh, the murders of children, of boys, male, first male children. So from the time Jesus entered upon this earth, he was marked for murder. Somebody was gonna take his life. And so the fallen stars that we heard about are fallen angels that I was talking about. So we hear that it says this, this dragon, he, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Remember, Satan is a fallen angel. There was a time when he was in heaven with God where he was one of God's worship leaders, where he served God, where he was an angel of light. And because of his arrogance, because of his need to be equal with God, because of his, um, 
his desire to be over God and over all of God's people, he got kicked out, got kicked out of heaven. And so it says this dragon stood in front of the woman. So he, Jesus, you know, has taken, has, is now the apple of God's eye and Satan is not. And so he's jealous and he's angry. And so his thing is to wipe Jesus out and everything that's related to him. Verse five says, she gave birth to a son, a male child who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Thank you, God, right? Jesus did what he had to do when he came upon the earth. That bloodshed has now saved us. Our sins are wiped away. We don't have to worry about anything. Uh, we have to live right, of course, while we're here upon this earth. But if we believe that Jesus is our Messiah and our Savior and that his blood has, has been shed for the remission of our sins, then we are saved and we are safe. All right. And then verse seven. So when all of this big showdown happens, we find out that there's this war that happens in heaven. All right. Verse seven says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back but he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. Now y'all might be saying, well, wait a minute. I thought Satan was cast down. How in the world is he having a war against Michael? And I always love reading about Michael. Michael was a, is a warrior, right? Every time we read about Michael, he's coming in, he's been fighting somebody. He's been fighting the prince of the air, right? Satan had nowhere to land while he, when he got kicked out of heaven because of his arrogance. And so he just kind of floats around. We know this, you know, he's, he's all over the place. They describe him as the prince of the air. So this war occurs between him and Michael and Michael's got his posse and Satan's got his and they're fighting, they're warring it out. But Satan becomes defeated because as much as he thinks he has strength and he does in some ways, it's still not enough to combat those who are on the side of the Lord. So glory, hallelujah, we got somebody fighting for us and it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be something where we can always feel safe. We can feel safe even now. Satan still has um, access to heaven though. All right. That's why this, this war is able to occur. He still has access to heaven. And you're like, well, Betty, what do you mean he has access to heaven? He was kicked out. Remember Job 1 and 7, where God is asking Satan, where you been? And he says, oh, I've just been roaming about all over the earth, seeing what I can get into, right? And then God offers up Job because Satan is challenging God and saying, you know what? I bet if you didn't do all these great things for Job, he turned his back on you, you know? And so he's jealous. He doesn't want people to worship the Lord. And so we see him having this conversation with God because he has access to God still. But during this time of the great tribulation, he's going to be cast out of heaven for good. All right. Out of heaven for good. And oh my gosh, that's going to make him mad, mad, a new kind of mad. And I want to put, like Pastor Chris uh, says, a needle, uh, no, a nickel, a quarter, or some amount of money <laughs> in the meter for a minute, because I got to say this to y'all, because we're all guilty of it. And you might not like this, but I'm about to show you some script scripture, and I'm going to have to um, get us, okay, Facebook wasn't, um, it's not up. It's, can y'all still see me on Facebook, or has it stopped? Send me a thumbs up or uh, some hearts or something just to let me know if you all can still see me uh, and hear me. Because I don't have too much control over what happens on, on, uh, on there. All right, they're sending a thumbs up. Thank y'all. All right, and this is important. I want everybody to hear this part of it. All right, very good. All right, so um, there is scripture. And... Um, I was looking for this some time ago because I know I'd read it in one of my forays into the whole Bible, but I couldn't remember where I'd read it. And I'm so glad I listened to the sermon um, with Dr. Corson. And so it can be found in Jude 4 and 9. And basically what the Lord is saying to all of us is this. We are not to slander people who are in positions of power, no matter how evil we think they are dignitaries, presidents, <laughs> heads of companies and nations, 
because we are all creations of God, even Satan himself, all right? And so what he says and what Michael um, demonstrates for us in this particular part of the scripture is this, and I'm hoping y'all can see me. Um, do y'all see verse nine, Jude, my people on Zoom? Can I get a nod or a no? Okay, you can see it? All right, beautiful. Verse nine says, but even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him. But he said, the Lord rebuked you. Okay? Keep that in mind. I know a lot of times we get mad about the things that we're seeing on the news and the leadership that we currently have, and we want to trash that person, and we, we got all kinds of views and judgments about them. But the word tells us that when we are faced with even the most evil of people, somebody like... Uh, the devil, that we are to act as Michael did. And you can read the scriptures all around that, but I just wanted to highlight nine, where when they are arguing over the body of Moses, Michael did not trash the devil. He did not come at him hard and start um, uh, uh, rebuking him on his own. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He put the Lord between him and the evil that was in front of him. And that's what we have to do. I told y'all in Sunday school, you know, I try to, I try my very best to pray for those people who come up against me really hard. Um, and I try, oh Lord, I know y'all, it is hard to do. And I know we want uh, to be able to say what we want to say, but if you're going to go and act as a Christian and live according to the will and the way of the Lord, he's saying, put the Lord between you and those who are evil. Ask God to rebuke that person. All right. And so that's what we're going to have to say. If the angels have to follow that, so do we, all right? And so be careful how you speak about people. And as I look, as I've, tell, I've told y'all a million and one times, and I'm going to call him by name, Donald Trump, as I look at this man in the position that he's in, I've said it before, everybody has a, God has a way of using all kinds of people to advance his will, to advance his plan. They might not be the people you think ought to be in there, but God knows exactly what he's doing. His plan is perfect, all right? We might not always understand why he's doing what he's doing, but we just have to trust his plan. And so if he puts somebody in who we can't understand, what in the world is this, is this person doing? And why are all the people standing around him watching him doing this and going along with it? Well, God uses people who he knows will do some of the things that others will not. Some people might be um, a, a more, so morally upright that they see the errors in doing some of the things that this man has, has done. I'm not going to say accomplished, but has done. And so it requires somebody like him who will come in and do something of the dirty work. And so when we, even as I told y'all about, you know, what's going to happen in Israel as the setup for the Antichrist, we don't know if something this man is doing right now may be a setup for what is to happen five years down the road, a hundred years down the road, when, when Donald Trump went in there and, and acknowledged, you know, uh, uh, moving the capital uh, to, uh, in Israel, when nobody else wanted to touch that, right? Everybody's like, oh my gosh, did he just really do that? And, and they were shocked. Nobody, people know, everybody all over the world knows better than for, to get in the middle of that. That's not our fight. We are big uh, advocates and allies to Israel, and we'll be there to help them whenever the, anything goes wrong with them. But that's not our fight. And people have known to walk a very fine line. This man came in brazen, right? He's coming in and making declarations that nobody else would do. Only he could do something like that. So if that's what's necessary to start things uh, toward where God wants it to go in terms of setting up the end times prophecy so that they can happen, then Donald Trump is where he's supposed to be and doing what he needs to do. And so he may not be finished. You know, we don't know what God's plan is. So we can't trash what people do and we can't trash those people. They are quite, God used the pharaohs when he needed to. They were awful people, but he used them to advance uh, his plan. And so we don't understand the methods, but we have to understand it. So uh, off my soapbox with that, I just wanted to bring that to our attention that we might need to be careful. And so who is Satan? Who, who is this, this fallen angel? Like I told you, he was once the greatest of angels. He was the angel of light, but then he perverted his service to God. He was so prideful, so full of arrogance 
he showed so much jealousy that God was like, you can't be up here, all right? You are not what I set out for my people. And so we know that his name means adversary in the Old Testament. And if, if we looked at it in terms of him being in the courtroom, when it comes to judgment, God is seated on the throne, he would be the prosecutor of men. He would be the one that would say, would pass judgment against uh, man before God. He would be the accuser, right? Uh, he's not looking out for the best interest of, of anybody uh, but himself. So he's the adversary. That's what his name means. Um, on the other hand, if we had to look to uh, who would be our biggest supporters, then that would be Michael. Michael is the counsel for the defense. He's the one that's going to advocate for us. He's not going to slander us. That's what Satan does. He's a slanderer. He's also a liar. The Bible describes him in all those ways. So we know he means no good to any man. So once he's kicked out of heaven, he is mad, mad a new kind of man, if he wasn't mad enough before. He's given power upon the earth. The Lord kicks him out and says, okay, you have been cast down. You are out of heaven for good. You don't even have access to me anymore. And he knows, and let's look at, um, it's right here on, in verse, we're still in chapter 12, but verse 12. And that B portion, I don't know if I have this. I hope y'all can still see it, y'all. <clears throat> that B portion says, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. <clears throat> He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So he's going to get really, really, really desperate. And so he's going to be able to have access to the earth. The Lord is going to give him access to the earth. So those people who are still here upon the earth, we, we know all the destruction that's going to be going on. And we know that all these evil spirits have been allowed to uh, roam the earth. It's going to be a horrible, horrible time for those who are left here. All right, so I'm going to wrap this up, and we're looking at the beast of the sea, and this is a, the, our last part of the scripture. This is chapter, um, this is still chapter 12, and so if you look at uh, verses 13 through 7, I'll read those real quick. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. You'll find that time frame mentioned very often in a book of Revelation. And basically it means um, a time, which is like a, a year, I think, it, or a year. And then you multiply that times three and then the half time. So that's three and a half years, all right? Anytime you see 42 months, 1260 days, time, time and a half times, all of that means three and a half years. And so we're still in the tribulation time. And so then from this, uh, then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the, the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offerings or her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So basically this dragon is trying to kill her, this woman, uh, the church, all right, all of us who have been around uh, and those who will be left behind still trying to get their way into heaven. And because he's been cast out and hurled away and, um, and cast upon the earth with no more access to God, he is extremely furious and he's going to start destroying things, all kinds of people and the earth itself. And so when he realizes that his time is short and that um, God's getting ready to destroy him and that his reign upon the earth is also going to be over, um, Satan's going to do everything he can to bring people uh, not just into his court, but to make sure they don't have access to God. Satan knows what a good place that was for him. He really does. I mean, he was in the glory of the Lord. He had access to God. He knew what that was like. And he apparently was really good as a servant of God at one point. But we let this be a lesson to all of us. When we get so full of pride, when we get so caught up in ourselves, when we get so center focused, you know, only on us, that we can lose sight of what's important to God. We can lose sight of what we're supposed to be doing as uh, people who are supposed to be reaching out to all mankind. We get too caught up in things of the world and we forget that we are spirit 
and that our spirits are supposed to be uh, going out upon this earth and doing, you know, and doing battle with those that would come against us. And so there's belief that the Antichrist is already here. I hear people say that all the time. We don't know when this is going to come, but I tell you, the people who study this over and over again have the strong belief that this is going to happen in short order. I don't try to put no time frames on nothing. I just say, Lord, prepare me for that time. No matter how crazy the world is going to be happening at this time, let your will be done. Huh? When we, we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, it's like, come, Lord, bring it on, because I know where I'm going to end up. And it's because the Lord has told me where I'm going to end up. That's not an arrogant statement. That's a statement of confidence, simply because the Lord has assured us of these things. He's given us these promises. That's why when we're in the midst of all of what it seems like is just all kinds of stuff going crazy here and people are acting all foolish around each other over some of the most minute things and even over some big things, you know, we don't have to get caught up in that and say the world is falling apart. Yeah, the world is doing some crazy stuff, but we are not of the world. We are set apart. We are sanctified. We have been um, um, put in a particular place for when Jesus comes back to get us and we can be caught up with him. So some believe when we read about her being caught up on these wings of eagles, some believe, you know, that would be the United States. That's America coming to the aid of Israel, because, of course, we have the eagle as a symbol of freedom for us as part of our country. And every time the Bible talks about the eagle, it talks about it, it signifies freedom. And so she's going to get caught up and be whisked away on the wings of an eagle and taken to a safe place. And basically that means since we're talking about this woman is uh, indicative of the church, those who are still left here will find a safe haven. And it's in this place called Petra. There's supposed to be a real place where they be, will be whisked away to. And um, when Satan is, you know, roaming the earth and, you know, wreaking havoc everywhere and tearing up all kinds of stuff and killing people, they will find a uh, safety uh, in this particular haven. And I believe, and, and the last part of that is, um, as much as this whole spewing, we hear he's going to be so mad, he's going to be spitting water and just up chucking all kinds of stuff, that anger, he's going to be breathing, I mean, just water, water, water. Apparently, uh, this is, there is an actual um, phenomenon that happens in Asia Minor where uh, the water looks like it goes away, it's sucked away by the sand. And so it travels, it gets soaked into the sand and it travels farther down the road a piece, I guess. And then it reemerges. And so it looks like water disappears and then it comes back. That actually happened to Colossae apparently at some point. So John was aware that maybe that was what he saw as part of his vision. So nature itself is going to stop her from being um, washed away as, as, as the devil is going to try to do by releasing this torrent of water over her. So basically, God's people, those who are sealed on the forehead, those he's identified for himself will be kept safe. All right. So there's going to be a big war going on, y'all. It's going to be a horrible time. And so what we will continue to do then as we talk every week and as I wrap this up is we're going to continue to keep those who we love and know and even those we don't know and those who are sometimes unlovable. We are going to keep them in prayer. We are going to do the right thing. We are going to ask the Lord to bless them. We're going to ask the Lord to move upon their hearts and soften their hearts that have become hard. We're going to ask the Lord to be a thorn in their sides, you know, and just keep at them and keep at them so that we don't lose them. We don't lose them to the ways of the world and to the wiles of the devil. It is an important thing that we have to, we can't just think that this is some like, you know, Twilight Zone kind of stuff or a story or a fable in the Bible, but that this is really going to take place. Um, and, and these things are, are happening in the world today. And so as we look at how uh, uh, the nation is changing and shifting, I just saw a news article just this past week about how our current uh, leadership is so focused on fighting us domestically, fighting his own people, that he's um, not taking care of foreign policy. Do you know Putin just uh, got approval from his people where he will be in office as president most likely until he dies? All right. At one point, he can only serve a certain term. He's already been in there, I think, two or three terms. Now he set himself up to be the leader of Russia for years and years to come. And then there's China, which has also uh, gone back on... Um, an agreement that they made to uh, keep Hong Kong uh, as its own democracy. And so they were supposed to do that for a particular time and go back and I guess renegotiate it, but they've already gone back on that. 
So they are also becoming stronger. These other nations are becoming stronger as we are becoming weaker. And so that's what I'm saying. Look at what's happening around you. What does it mean in the grand scheme of things? I'm sure a lot. This stuff isn't just happening by happenstance. We have leadership in here who's taking his eye off the ball and our country is being compromised as a superpower. So, you know, all I can say is, you know, just keep praying, y'all. Just stay prayerful and let's all pray that the Lord's will be done and that his kingdom will come. And when it does, we will continue to be able to shout the victory, the victory, all right, in the Lord Jesus. All right, I have no clue what time it is. Somebody want to tell me what time it is? Am I over time? It's, okay, somebody going to send me this on the... 7.59. Okay, awesome. That works. I'm right on time then. So I appreciate y'all then. I'm, I can kind of feel that I've been at that for so long. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out with prayer. Thank y'all so much for staying in touch. Folks on uh, Facebook Live, I appreciate you. We'll be right back here again on um, next Wednesday, where we'll tackle the next few chapters. We stopped at chapter 13, y'all. So go ahead and start reading. I'm going to try to go through. We're going to look at the beast of the sea next week. And we're also going to look at the lamb and the 144,000, which is in chapter 14. And if I can get to chapter 15, the seven angels with the seven plays, because that's the third set of judgments, oh my goodness, that are going to be uh, released uh, we're moving along. We're checking along, uh, checking along pretty well in this. So thank you for your time and attention. Uh, just as a reminder, Sunday school, for those of you who came on late, will start at its regular time at nine o'clock on Sunday. So Alicia Moses will be teaching us. It's coming from our new book and our new book is um, available to you at the church. You can go pick it up. We're going to be talking about Moses at the, as the prophet. And that's going to be coming from Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 22. So go ahead and read that and be prepared to uh, share. All right. With that being said, let us bow our heads. Father God, we are so grateful to you for yet another time, another time with you, Lord God. Thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the victory, Lord God. Thank you for the confidence that you've got this thing all wrapped up. No matter how crazy the world is, Lord God, we will be victorious. We will celebrate. We will proclaim you as king over all, Lord God. We know that we have access to your throne. We will inherit um, uh, the earth and we will go into heaven and be as brothers and sisters in Christ and along with Christ, Lord God. And so we don't have to fear anything that's to come. We know that there are going to be some very difficult and destructive times and there will be many terrors upon the earth. And there will be much suffering upon the earth. But Lord God, if we will just hold on for yet a little while, Lord God, we will be able to make it into that place of victory with you. So we celebrate you, Lord. We glorify you. We just, we're excited to know you. We thank you that you've chosen us, Lord God, to be your people too. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us as Gentiles access to you. And so we praise and worship you. And we ask that we continue to be the people you would have us to be. Give us courage, Lord. Let us walk out boldly in your name and to share this word everywhere we go. Whatever parts of it we understand, Lord, make it continue to be clear to us. Those parts we don't understand, Lord, we know you will reveal your mysteries in due time. And so we just ask that you would continue to help us to move in the faith. For those, Lord, who are struggling in their bodies, who need healing, Lord, we ask a fresh anointing upon them, Lord God. We ask that we know Lord God, that you are a healer. We ask as humbly as we know God, uh, how, Lord God, that you would go in and you would touch those people. They have been struggling for a while, Lord God. They are looking to you uh, for faith and hope. We're, they're asking for your strength, Lord God, as they struggle through. I just feel there's some people in my spirit right now who are struggling and they are uh, becoming weaker, Lord God, because they're not seeing your answers yet. So we just pray on their behalf that you would be there with them. Give them your strength, Lord God. Give them encouragement and let them know that your will in their lives, it will be complete. And we just thank you for that right now for answer prayer. And we pray all these many blessings in your holy son, Jesus name. Amen. Thank y'all. We appreciate you so much. Thank y'all for being a part of this, um, this time. And so for you, hey, all right, so for y'all on a uh, line, is there anything y'all got to say um, y'all want to ask or any final comments, questions? No. Thank you, Miss Carrie. <laughs> you speak of everybody. No. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I appreciate y'all.
All right. Take it easy. I'm cutting you off. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Be safe.